Today, we bring you a haunting tale that captures the final moments of the ill-fated passengers aboard the doomed Titanic submersible. Prepare to embark on a journey of mystery and tragedy as we uncover how these brave explorers spent their final moments before tragedy struck. Let's dive into this heart-rending tale together. On 18 June 2023, Titan, a submersible operated by American Tourism and Expeditions Company OceanGate, imploded during an expedition to view the wreck of the Titanic in the North Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada. On board the submersible were Stockton Rush, the CEO of OceanGate, Paul Henry Narjolet, a French deep-sea explorer and Titanic expert, Hamish Harding, a British billionaire businessman, Shahzada Dawood, a Pakistani-British billionaire businessman, and Dawood's son Suleiman. Rob McCollum, an expedition consultant who previously gave OceanGate advice on marketing and logistics, told The New Yorker that he received early reports on the Titan's fateful final dive. The report that I got immediately after the event, long before they were overdue, was that the sub was approaching 3,500 meters, he told The New Yorker's Ben Tubb. McCollum said the submersible had dropped weights, which meant the dive was aborted and then lost communication with its mothership. At such depths, the Titan likely imploded with so much force that those inside were killed instantly, with no time to realize the hull had collapsed. Authorities are still investigating the implosion, and it's currently unclear exactly how aware the five passengers were of the impending danger or if they had any advance warning of hull failure at all. The Titan would also regularly run into hiccups like failures with its battery and ballast system, according to former passenger. Rush was piloting the submersible at the time and was likely in charge of the dive. How doomed Titanic sub-passengers spent their final moments? According to the account provided by a victim's wife, the passengers spent their final moments in total darkness, accompanied by music, while observing the mesmerizing bioluminescent creatures of the deep sea. The ill-fated dive commenced on June 18 at 8 a.m. with the intention of reaching the wreckage of the Titanic. However, contact with the submersible was lost one hour and 45 minutes into the dive, precisely at 9.45 a.m. The U.S. Navy later confirmed that they detected the sound of an implosion at that moment. After five days, debris from the submersible was discovered on the seabed, approximately 1,600 feet away from the Titanic wreckage. The incident remains a tragic reminder of the risks involved in exploring the depths of the ocean. The Last Hours of the Titan The New York Times reported on the tragic details surrounding the final moments of the passengers on board the Titan submersible. The wife and mother of Shazada and Suleiman Dawood, the father-son duo who were among the passengers, shared their account, revealing that the ill-fated dive was the culmination of their family's long-standing fascination with the Titanic wreckage. The Dawood family's obsession with the 111-year-old wreckage began when they visited a Titanic exhibit in Singapore back in 2012. This encounter ignited their imagination and sparked a deep interest in the historical tragedy. Their passion led them to embark on the doomed trip aboard the Titan submersible, hoping to explore the remnants of the iconic ship. The Dawood family's fascination with the Titanic continued to intensify following a trip to Greenland in 2019. During their visit, they became captivated by glaciers that gradually transformed into icebergs, reminiscent of the same perilous ocean hazard that played a role in the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. Christine Dawood, the wife and mother of the family, came across an advertisement by OceanGate offering trips to the Titanic wreckage. Originally, Christine was meant to accompany her billionaire husband on the excursion. However, due to pandemic-related delays, their plans had to be rescheduled. By the time the opportunity to go on the dive arose, their 19-year-old son, Suleiman, had reached the age where he could participate, leading him to take his mother's place on the ill-fated trip. Christine Dawood disclosed that her husband and son almost did not embark on the ill-fated Father's Day trip that would take them more than 13,000 feet below the ocean's surface. The journey began with their flight to St. John's, Newfoundland, where the mothership was scheduled to depart from. However, their initial flight was canceled, and the subsequent flight they managed to catch was delayed. We were actually quite worried. Like, oh my god, what if they cancel that flight as well? Christine told the Times. In hindsight, obviously, I wish they did. The Dawood family did make it to the Polar Prince in time for the dive. 
Christine and her 17-year-old daughter, Alina, were present on June 18 to witness Shahzada, Suleiman, and three others enter the 22-foot submersible. The individuals who entered the submersible included Ocean Gate founder and CEO Stockton Rush, renowned Titanic explorer Paul Henry Nargillet, and British billionaire Hamish Harding. With the departure of the submersible, they disappeared into the depths of the Atlantic Ocean. According to Christine Dawood, despite the less than ideal conditions aboard the Polar Prince, including cramped accommodations with bunk beds and meals served on trays, her husband and son were filled with excitement for the upcoming trip. In the days leading up to the voyage, they endured lengthy 12-hour meetings related to the logistics and preparations for the dive. There were all hands meeting every day at 7 a.m. and again at 7 p.m., lasting an hour or more. What did we learn? What are we going to do? What do we need to think about? OceanGate, the company organizing the expedition, marketed the experience as an opportunity for the participants to be explorers, adventurers, and citizen scientists. This description appealed to the Dawood family's sense of adventure and their desire to be part of a unique and meaningful exploration of the Titanic wreckage. Suleiman carried a Rubik's Cube. Shahzadat had a Nikon camera, eager to capture the view of the seafloor through Titan's single porthole. He was like a vibrating toddler. Christine told the times of her son's excitement just before he set off on the sub. As for her husband, Christine said he longed to have the same adventures as Nargillette, a famed Titanic diver who told the family of a time when he was trapped in a sub for three days. Oh my God, this is so cool, she recalled her husband saying. He was lapping everything up. He had this big glow on his face, talking about all this nerdy stuff. Despite having paid a significant sum of $250,000 each for both Shazada and Suleiman to participate in the trip, their accommodations were far from luxurious. Christine Dawood revealed that the family had to sleep in cramped rooms with bunk beds and had buffet-style meals served on trays. These conditions were not as comfortable or extravagant as one might expect for a high-cost expedition. According to Christine Dawood, the majority of the meetings held during their time aboard the Polar Prince were focused on learning about the controversial, submersible, and its safety. These meetings were likely aimed at providing the participants with the necessary information and instructions regarding the dive and the operation of the submersible. That engineering side, we just had no idea, she said. I mean, you sit in a plane without knowing how the engine works. Christine is not the only one who has admitted to being puzzled by the Titan sub's mechanism. According to Bill Price, who boarded the Titan submersible in 2021, his trip had to be aborted due to a propulsion system failure on one side of the sub. Price informed the New York Times that the vehicle's drop weight mechanism, which is used for ascent, could not be released by Stockton Rush, the CEO of OceanGate. In an attempt to resolve the issue, Rush instructed the passengers to try rocking the submersible, presumably to help dislodge or free the mechanism. After several rolls, we got the momentum going, Mr. Price said. Then, we heard a clunk, and we all collectively knew one weight had dropped off. So we continued to do that until the weights were all out and the vehicle slowly rose back to the surface. Bill Price recounted that despite the propulsion system issue during his initial attempt to board the Titan submersible, the crew proceeded to embark on another dive the following day. On this subsequent dive, they successfully visited the shipwreck without encountering any further problems. Price also mentioned that one of the safety lessons during their preparations covered implosions caused by pressure, which is the very event that seems to have occurred with the submersible last month. This suggests that the crew was aware of the risks associated with extreme pressure in the deep sea and had received training on how to mitigate them. According to Bill Price, he and the other passengers were informed about the intense pressure they would experience in the deep ocean. They were told that the pressure would be comparable to smashing a Coke can with a sledgehammer or being crushed by an elephant standing on one foot, with an additional 100 elephants on top of it. Price described this description as macabre, but also found reassurance in the notion that death would be instantaneous under such extreme pressure. In addition to the engineering lessons, Christine Dawood mentioned that the passengers were entertained with stories of the deep by Stockton Rush, the CEO of OceanGate. These anecdotes likely aim to captivate the passengers and enhance their sense of adventure and exploration. By the time the passengers reached their launch-off spot in the middle of the ocean, 
Christine Dawood expressed feeling reassured by what she perceived as a well-organized and efficient operation run by OceanGate. The crew had prepared the passengers for what they could expect during the dive, creating a sense of confidence in the expedition's management. Rush told passengers they should have a low-residue diet the day before the trip, along with no coffee the morning of. He also recommended they wear thick socks and a beanie because of the frigid temperatures of the Atlantic. According to Christine Dawood, the passengers were cautioned about the possibility of condensation pools forming on the floor of the submersible. They were advised to avoid getting their feet wet to prevent discomfort or any potential hazards during the dive. Additionally, the passengers were informed that the submersible's lights would be turned off to conserve battery power until they reached the Titanic wreckage. Despite the lack of lighting, they were still likely to witness the mesmerizing display of bioluminescent sea creatures in the deep ocean. Rush said, don't expect to see anything through the porthole or the exterior cameras on the way down because the floodlights will be turned off to save battery power for the epic tour on the ocean floor, though there was a chance to catch glimpses of bioluminescent creatures, creating a sensation like falling through stars. To make the journey more enjoyable, the passengers were encouraged to load their favorite songs onto the sub's music player, as the dive could last up to four hours. However, Stockton Rush, the CEO of OceanGate, apparently jokingly instructed them not to load any country songs, adding a touch of humor to the preparations. On June 18, the divers, including Suleiman and Shazada, were instructed to be prepared for boarding by 7.30. They were equipped with OceanGate flight suits, waterproof trousers, orange waterproof jackets, steel-toed boots, life vests, and helmets, ensuring their safety and protection during the dive. As part of the pre-dive preparations, the divers also underwent a weighing procedure, which is a standard requirement. This step helps ensure that the weight distribution and load capacity of the submersible are properly managed for a safe and balanced dive. By adhering to these protocols, OceanGate aimed to prioritize the well-being and safety of the divers throughout their underwater exploration. I'm looking quite fat, Miss Dawood recalled her husband saying. I'm boiling up already. Suleiman confidently descended the stairs to enter the motorized raft, which would transport the passengers to the floating platform where the Titan submersible was secured. However, Shazada encountered some difficulties due to the cumbersome nature of his gear, particularly the clunky boots. Christine Dawood described how Shazada required an additional hand to navigate the stairs, ensuring he maintained balance while wearing the heavy equipment. As she watched Shazada's descent, along with her daughter Alina, she expressed concerns about the possibility of him accidentally falling into the water. After the divers reached the floating platform, they boarded the Titan submersible. From a distance, they appeared as tiny specks on the platform before eventually disappearing inside the submersible. Entering the submersible was likened to crawling through the back hatch of an SUV without seats. The interior featured a rubber mat on the floor and two handles on the ceiling for passengers to hold onto during the dive. Stockton Rush, the pilot, typically occupied the rear section of the submersible, positioned away from the porthole. Other passengers sat with their backs against the curved walls of the submersible. Once the divers were inside the Titan submersible, the hatch was securely closed and all the bolts were tightened using a ratchet. This ensured a watertight seal and added to the safety and integrity of the submersible. After the preparations were complete, the crew maneuvered the Titan submersible underwater, detaching it from the floating platform. Soon, the Titan slinked into the water and dropped into the deep, descending toward a dream. Christine Dawood expressed that her family's enthusiasm remained unwavering, despite any complaints or inconveniences they encountered. She mentioned that Shazada voiced his dissatisfaction about the amount of equipment he had to wear before entering the Titan sub, but even this did not dampen their overall excitement for the expedition. After bidding farewell to her husband and son, Christine, along with her daughter, watched as the submersible set off into the vastness of the Atlantic Ocean. The submersible moved at a slow speed of about one mile per hour, so gradual that no sense of motion would be felt. It was a good morning, Christine recalled, adding that her giddy husband repeatedly said the day before, I'm diving tomorrow. I'm diving tomorrow. Later that morning, Christine Dawood overheard someone mentioning that communication with the Titan submersible had been lost. 
This information was later confirmed by the United States Coast Guard, stating that contact had been lost approximately one hour and 45 minutes into the dive. Concerned about the situation, Christine made her way to the bridge where a team had been monitoring the slow descent of the Titan submersible. She sought reassurance regarding the communication issues and was informed that the only means of communication between the submersible and the ship was through coded computer text messages, which could be unreliable at times. However, if the communication break lasted for more than an hour, it was protocol to abort the dive. In such a situation, the Titan submersible would release weights to facilitate its ascent back to the surface. As the hours passed, Christine Dawood found herself overwhelmed by a growing sense of dread. By late afternoon, she was informed by someone that the whereabouts of the Titan submersible and its crew were unknown. This unsettling revelation intensified the anxiety and uncertainty surrounding the situation. I was also looking out on the ocean, in case I could maybe see them surfacing, she said. Four days later, while Christine Dawood and the crew of the support ship remained near the site of the Titanic Coast Guard, officials delivered the devastating news. They announced that debris from the Titan submersible had been discovered, indicating that it had most likely imploded. This tragic revelation led them to conclude that everyone on board the submersible had been instantly killed. In February, Stockton Rush, along with his wife Wendy, traveled to London to meet with the Dawood family. They gathered at a cafe near Waterloo Station to discuss various aspects of the submersible, including its design, functionality, and safety features. The conversation also touched upon the experience of descending into the depths of the ocean inside the submersible. Christine Dawood reflected on the meeting and expressed her astonishment at the engineering intricacies involved in the submersible's design. She compared it to the experience of sitting in an airplane without fully understanding the inner workings of its engine. This realization highlighted the complex nature of the technology behind the submersible and the level of expertise required to ensure its safety and functionality. Although Stockton Rush identified himself more as a scientist than a salesman, a significant portion of his efforts was dedicated to marketing his company and selling spots on the submersible. He recognized the importance of promoting OceanGate and generating interest in its expeditions. In order to establish credibility and create a buzz around the company, Rush sought a diverse range of clients who could provide validation and contribute to the overall excitement surrounding the submersible. Alan Stern a prominent planetary scientist from Colorado, expressed his interest in a dive with the Titan submersible in July. Upon learning about Stern's impressive background, which included being a jet pilot, polar explorer, and leader of NASA's New Horizons mission to explore Pluto and the Keeper Belt, Stockton Rush offered him a complimentary ticket for the dive. Stern gladly accepted the offer. Stockton Rush went even further by extending an exciting opportunity to Stern. He proposed that Stern could serve as the co-pilot for the dive, despite his lack of prior experience in piloting a submersible. Rush assured him that they would provide the necessary training, and all Stern had to do was make his way to St. John's, the departure point for the dive. Stern recalled the conversation, stating that Stockton's offer was, I don't care if you give a talk. Do you want to be the co-pilot? We'll get you trained. Get yourself to St. John's. Stern accepted the invitation, which allowed him to join the dive as a co-pilot, adding another exciting dimension to his already remarkable exploration experiences. OceanGate referred to the paying participants as mission specialists, rather than customers or tourists. This terminology emphasized their active involvement in the exploration mission and their role as contributors to the scientific and expeditionary goals of the submersible dives. To further foster a sense of identity and camaraderie, the company provided the mission specialists with personalized shirts and jackets adorned with their names and the flags of their respective countries. Additionally, a patch on the sleeve displayed the inscription Titanic Survey Exploration Crew, symbolizing their participation in the exploration of the Titanic wreck site. Deep water diving in a pocket submarine is the only extreme activity accessible to anyone in good health without training and regardless of age, Mr. Nargillet wrote in his book, had become a semi-permanent fixture, a quasi-member of Titanic royalty, a star and co-pilot on the Ocean Gate expeditions. The Ocean Gate promotional video, nearly six minutes of stirring music and wide smiles, displays the balance that the company tried to cultivate. Get ready for what Jules Verne could only imagine, 
the baritone voiceover, says, This is not a thrill ride for tourists. It's much more. OceanGate's proposition to the mission specialists was based on an estimated timeline of two and a half hours for the descent to the Titanic wreck, followed by a similar duration for the ascent back to the surface. In between, the passengers would have approximately four hours to explore and tour the wreckage. However, it is worth noting that most of the trips did not result in up-close views of the Titanic. Abortions of Titan missions were more common than successful completions. Despite the challenges and uncertainties involved, Stockton Rush had a remarkable ability to inspire confidence in the mission specialist through his open and transparent approach. Even when issues arose, he would address them with a good-natured attitude and ensure that the passengers were informed during debriefing sessions. For instance, if a test dive had to be canceled due to a computer connection problem that made controlling the Titan difficult, Rush would gather everyone for a debriefing to discuss the situation and provide update. This level of transparency and communication helped to maintain trust and build a positive atmosphere, even in the face of setbacks. To put it bluntly, that's why I called it, mostly because we've got to find out what this control problem is, he said in a conversation captured by a YouTuber who was on the expedition. That's sort of important, controlling the sub. Alan Stern, the planetary scientist with an aeronautics background, admitted that he was unaware of certain concerns that had been raised since the tragic accident involving the Titan submersible. These concerns, such as the letter from submersible experts, had come to light after his own expedition. Nonetheless, Stern returned safely from the dive and expressed his admiration for the safety protocols implemented during the expedition. He acknowledged that the possibility of implosion as a potential ending to the dive was something he had considered, given the nature of deep-sea exploration. However, based on his assessment and the fact that the Titan had completed numerous dives, including ones not related to the Titanic, he regarded this as an empirical indication of OceanGate's reliability and commitment to safety. On 28 June, Horizon Arctic returned to St. John's Harbor with the remains of Titan that were recovered from the debris field. Photos and video showed the titanium covers on both ends of Titan intact, with the single viewport missing mangled pieces of the tail cone, electronics, the landing frame, and other debris. The debris was to be transported to the U.S. as evidence in the investigation. The Coast Guard confirmed that presumed human remains were found within the debris and that American medical professionals would conduct an analysis. Pelagic Research Services, which was operating the Odysseus 6KROV from Horizon Arctic, confirmed that its team had completed their mission.